So we continue with um, uh, uh, discussion on the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We continue, we are still in uh, part 76. I was still in part 76. Uh, last week we looked at the place of tithe and tithing in the church. Uh, we specifically focused on the church as a new covenant creation and noted that the seven references in the New Testament where the um, issue of tithe was mentioned were actually directed at natural Israel. And it was either as a rebuke of the Pharisees or it was used to um, state the superiority <clears throat> of the Lord Jesus Christ over the um, priesthood, the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ over the priesthood of Aaron, which the children of Israel, even though they had been born again, uh, that is based on Hebrews, they continued to uh, follow that pattern. So the essence of that was to, 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 to let them understand that, look, the old is completely gone and there's a new, and the new is Christ. The old was Aaron, the new is Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked the Pharisees, it was because they were trying to use their payment of tithe as justification before God. And he said, no, they cannot be justified. We thus noted that New Testament believers are nowhere, nowhere in the Bible commanded or obligated to pay tithe. We also said that neither the Lord Jesus Christ nor the apostles after him who were themselves led by the Holy Spirit ask any believer to pay tithe. They didn't pay and they did not ask anybody to pay. The Lord Jesus Christ did not pay tithe, did not ask anybody to pay. We know that he paid tax because they asked him to pay tax. And he said, look, instead of us offending them, don't worry, let's pay the tax. He wasn't, he wasn't obligated to do that, but he did that anyway. So we then said that we are nonetheless not exonerated. Please mark my words. We are nonetheless not exonerated from acting responsibly in contributing to the welfare and upkeep of the needy and of ministers of the gospel. Please hear me very carefully. The fact that we are teaching the truth that is in the word of God. And the truth is that the tithe is not a requirement other the new covenant. But that does not mean that as a believer you are not obligated or responsible to make payments or to, 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 to give towards the welfare of, um, what do you call it now? Towards the welfare of um, the needy and of ministers of the gospel. What we are saying is that we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace. And we had noted, I think two weeks ago, that giving is a grace. And if we are under grace, then we must participate in giving. Now, we are going to come back to this as we conclude on what we want to discuss today. So let's go quickly and look at our scripture text. Um, I'm going to share my screen at this time. And we are looking at um, Acts chapter 4. And I'm just going to read verse 32, 34 to the end. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Verse 35. Uh, 34 rather. Nor was there any among anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each one as anyone had need. And Joseph, or Jose, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. We've discussed two, uh, two topics fully under this um, subject matter, that there may be no lack in the church, and we'll discuss the doctrine of giving. We're now looking at 
the place of uh, tithe and tithing. Uh, so we want to conclude, we we'll continue and conclude on that topic, meeting needs in the church, which will be part three, the place of tithe and tithing in the church, part two, meeting needs in the church, part three, the place of tithe and tithing in the church, part two. So we basically want to consider today some Old Testament and possibly, well, New Testament derivatives from that, precepts that many or may want to make us think that um, tithing is a New Testament thing. It is still applicable to New Testament believers. And um, we'll read for that uh, purpose Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 15 to 18, Galatians 3, from verse 15 to 18. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, that is, which came 430 years after that promise, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So the argument being placed here is that since Abraham paid tithe before the law, and the covenant that God made with Abraham cannot be annulled just because of the law that came 430 years later, then the payment of the tithe should remain. Now, the argument falls in its face because they fail to realize that here Galatians is discussing the promise of Christ and the issue of law. That's what Galatians is referring to here. And he's saying that the law that people are following was not annulled because, uh, uh, sorry, the law cannot annul Abraham's, the promise that God made to Abraham. That's what he's saying essentially. So that Christ has come as the descendant once, he said, your seed, not seeds, but one seed as in Christ. And that seed has come. And that seed is the one that we are supposed to follow. That is what is being mentioned here. That is the essence of that discussion here. But just to pursue it a little bit, I want us to note that the Abrahamic covenant actually came, was, was actually put in place in Genesis chapter 15 when God spoke to Abraham about him having a son. And it was perfected, let me put it that way, in Genesis 17, when God came and told Abraham that, walk before me and be thou blameless. I also want you to know that when this covenant was made, Abraham was not involved in that covenant. He was, it was made with him all right, but it was between God the Father and God the Son, the burning lamp and the stove that moved over the pieces. Abraham understood what was happening. He understood it. We are the ones who are struggling with understanding what took place that day in Genesis 15. But having said that, I want us to note that Abraham was not yet Abraham until Genesis 17, which was when the covenant actually took full, took, took foothold. And the, uh, what do you call it now? The token of the covenant was circumcision. It wasn't tithe. It was circumcision which has been done away with after Christ came. But having said all of that, I want us to also now know that Abraham paid tithe in Genesis chapter 14. That was when Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. And his name was Abraham. His name had not been changed. His name was still Abraham when he paid tithe. The covenant had not even been caught when he paid tithe. So talking about law and covenant uh, with Abraham does not even hold here at all. What Abraham did was a mark of regard 
for the priesthood of Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek came to receive him. In fact, let's read it. Let's read it so that it's not as if I'm just speaking. Because I know that if I ask us to read, many of us will not go and read. So, Genesis chapter 14. I'll just read from verse... Um, uh, let me read from verse 17 of Genesis 14. And king, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Kedelorama and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that is Abraham, gave him a tithe of all. So Abraham gave a tithe after he had been victorious over the battle. And the tithe that Abraham gave was the tithe of what he had taken in battle. He never gave, we never heard that Abraham gave tithe of his own flock or anything. He did not. But when he returned from battle and Melchizedek came to meet him, Abraham gave him tithe, recognizing him, recognizing him as priest. And the Bible even affirmed that, we looked at that last week, in Hebrews, that it affirmed that the, 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 the greater blesses the lesser and that the lesser gives tithe to the greater. And that's what happened here. And we, we had said last week that, look, this was just a matter of recognizing the superiority of uh, Melchizedek over Abraham. And that was it. They merely used tithe to explain that superiority. Now, so basically... We also want to note here that when Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek, he did not give tithe by compulsion. He did not give tithe by commandment. He was not commanded. He was not compelled to give tithe. He gave tithe freely. Now, I also want you to note that after Abraham gave tithe, nowhere did we read that um, Isaac the direct descendant of Abraham gave tithe. Nowhere. And we know that Isaac was richer than Abraham and he never gave tithe. We also know that Jacob made a promise. He made a promise to give a tenth of all that he would have when he returned from um, his, his sojourn. He promised God that he would give that. Now, nowhere in the Bible is it recorded that Jacob actually fulfilled that promise. We don't have it on record. And we also don't have on record that after Jacob, Joseph, Reuben, Judah, none of the sons of Jacob, nor their descendants, are ever recorded to have given tithe. So we, we will conclude that that scripture which we read in Galatians chapter 3 is referring primarily to the promise God made to Abraham concerning a seed that was coming and that through that seed, the whole earth will be blessed and saying that that seed is Christ. That seed has come. Telling the, the Galatians that the Gentiles, the, the Jews who are coming to trouble them on the matter of circumcision should understand that the, the law had been put away and that Circumcision, by putting the law away, had also gone out. So if circumcision, the token of the covenant with Abraham, was removed, is it tithe? Anyway, so that is um, one, one argument that they, they have always put in place. That the, 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 law can, the law cannot abrogate the covenant with Abraham. And the, the truth of the matter is that the covenant that God made with Abraham was not made until after Abraham paid tithe. So the, if you are talking of a covenant, then tithe had no business in that covenant. And the covenant itself did not require Abraham to pay tithe. Whenever you have a covenant, there, is, there are ordinances and laws that go with that. It's like an agreement. There are things that are expected of you and the other party in that agreement. It was never stated. Either in Genesis 15 or Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, when God came to 
affirmed that covenant with Abraham. He, the token of that covenant was circumcision. He told Abraham that day to circumcise himself and his entire household. And Abraham did it. And that when the son was to be born, when the son that God was going to give him was going to come, that on the eighth day, he should circumcise that boy. And on the eighth day, Abraham circumcised the boy. Hence, circumcision came into force. And so that nullifies that argument completely. It was, the, the Bible is not talking about, um, what's it called now? The Bible is not there talking about the issue of circumcision, uh, the issue of uh, tithe, or no. no. It's, te it's telling us in Galatians 3 that the law has been done away with. The promised seed has come. The seed is Christ. It wasn't even Isaac. It wasn't even Jacob. Now there's a second argument which I want us to also look at. And that is Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, uh, verse 8 to 12. Malachi 3, or let me read it from verse 6. Malachi 3 from verse 6. Okay, no, let me take it from verse 3, sorry, right from verse 8. Malachi 3, 8 to 12. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. All and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now, this is an argument that has been put forward. So where do we put this scripture? That's what, Where do we put this scripture? The Bible says, bring ye all the tithes, that there may be meat in the house of the Lord. Now, I'm going to go on, on, on a historical um, journey with you to explain this. But first of all, let us note, and I want to put it in very strong terms, that these verses of scripture apply to Jews. They apply to Jews. If you look at verse 11, it says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. Here, is, you, you see, they were an agrarian nation. And basically, the reference was to this. But let's, let's just go and look at some verses of scripture. Let's go to Deuteronomy and see what the Bible tells us about the issue of tithe and how it relates to this. Deuteronomy 14, I'm going to read from verse 22 to verse 20. Well, let me read from verse 22, we'll probably go to verse 29. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord, your God, in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine, and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds, and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. You will eat your tithe in a place that God has put, that God has said, this is where you are going to come and eat the tithe. You bring the tithe and you eat it there. Why? So that you will learn to respect, to reverence God, recognizing him as your provider. Verse 24. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires. You shall eat there, before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. It was such a time as this that Elkanah went with his two wives to Shiloh to celebrate, and he gave them portions to eat. Verse 27, you shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. Now, this is what they would say. When you are eating this, don't forget the Levites, so make sure that they are part of it. Now, in verse 20, it says, At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce for of that year and store it up within your gates. 
and the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands which you do. This was the law of tithing. They had the first year tithe, which is what we read earlier. You have your, 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 the increase of your goats, the increase of your sheep, the increase of your farmland, and so on and so forth. You pick, you get a tenth of that increase. And you take it to that place, Shiloh at first, then it became Jerusalem. You take it to that place. And when you get there, you will eat it in the presence of God, you and your family. If the place is too far for you, you will change, you, you will sell it off where you are for money. When you now get to Shiloh or Jerusalem, as the case may be, you will now use that money to buy whatever your heart desires. And you and your family will sit down and eat. Then he says, but do not forget while you are eating, not to give the Levites. Because they have no inheritance. They have no fun. They have nothing. So you must make sure that you give them. And of course, by implication, you also give to the strangers and to the widows. That was it. Then in the third year, this applied to first and second year, the first and second years. In the third year, that all the tithe of the third year, you are not to touch one. You are to gather it in your cities and then you will bring, you will give it to the Levites. You all take it to the Levites and say, this is your share for the third year. Then in the fourth and the fifth years also, you will continue as the first and second. In the sixth year, which is another third year, you will do the same. So this was the law. This was what was expected of them. But what happened was that they never did this. Let, let me, if I, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Again, we'll see something there. Uh, verse 15, and I'll read, I think, verse, uh, verse 12 to 15. Verse 12 to 15. Okay. He says, when you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled. You see what the tithe was used for. It wasn't used for buildings. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house, and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have I removed any of it for an unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God, and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. They were still in the wilderness when God commanded Moses to tell them this. Then they came into the promised land. Maybe the years of war and so many things that happened. They completely forgot about the issue of time. It was Hezekiah during his time of reformation in second, I won't have time to read Second Chronicles. You can note Second Chronicles chapter 31. Go and read it. Where the issue of tithing now came up again and the people brought so much for the Levites. Shortly after that, because of the continued rebellion of people of, 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 of uh, Israel and of Judah, they went into exile. After exile, they returned from exile. When they returned from exile, there was the, the, the what I call the reformation of Nehemiah. Nehemiah brought some reforms there. And they went back to the word of God and said, what is it that word God expects us to do? Let's go ahead and do those things. So when um, uh, Nehemiah came, they read those things and Nehemiah said, no, let us do these things. Let, let me, let me uh, look at that again. Um, I'm not sure if I'm sharing my screen. So let me confirm that I'm sharing it. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 10, and I'm going to read verse 37 and 38, um, 35. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all 
fruit of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord, to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, to, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities. And the priests and the descendants of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the room of the storehouse. This was what they discovered was written in the, in the scriptures. And so they said, we are going to implement this. In Nehemiah's time, they had returned from exile. Now, Nehemiah now went off, after all of this, Nehemiah went off for some time and returned. And when he returned, he discovered some strange things. Let me read it from, um, uh, where do I read it from now? Whew. Okay, let me take it from verse 3. So it was, when they heard, when they had heard the law, that they separated all the mixed multitude. The man had now returned. Let me read from verse 1. Let's just take from verse 1. On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. Because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water. But hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they had heard the law, that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Now, before this, Eliashim, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings of the priests. But during all this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king. And I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms. And I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. And the frankincense. I also realized, now note this from verse 10. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. Verse 13. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the, the scribe. And of the Levites, Pediah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zacho, the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Now, what have we read here? We have read a situation in which Israel were given a command to tithe. But they did not. And then there were reformations. During each reformation, they would try to tithe. Then they would stop. Nehemiah comes and says, bring all the, all the tithe in. They quickly rushed it in. But I'm sure after some time, they stopped. So by the time you got to Malachi, by the time of Malachi's time, God now affirms what Nehemiah had said and said, you know what, from now on, there's not going to be any first-year tithe, no more second-year tithe, but all the tithes. So when you read, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that they may be meet, God is saying, we have abrogated first and second tithe, now bring all the tithe. Because they were easy, it was easy for them to eat the first and second-year tithe, but forget the third-year tithe. And God says, you know what? Since you have loss of memory on this thing, let's cancel all of that and bring all the tithe. So when you read, bring you all the tithe, what he's referring to is that no more first year tithe, no more second year tithe, no more third year tithe. All the tithe are to be brought in because they did not bring the tithe over time. 
remember that passage of scripture is referring to the Jews. It's not a reference to the Gentiles. So, how do we conclude? I'm going to conclude by making some very bold statements on this matter. Tithe or tithing is not meant to be a controversial issue. It is not controversial. I do not intend to make it a controversy. It is not a controversy. It's not for argument's sake. No. We are, talk, we are studying the word of God and we are looking at its application to the new covenant believer. And we are going to see some very interesting things as I make this bold statement. Number one, the new covenant abrogated the old covenant. It wiped it out completely in its entirety. And it swallowed up. It consumed the Abrahamic covenant. Once Christ came, everything ended. All those small, small covenants were completely taken out and only one covenant mattered. And that was the covenant that God was now making with those who will come to Christ in the new dispensation. Let's go to um, Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm just going to read uh, verse 7 to 13. Hebrews 8, 7 to 13. For if that first covenant, that's the old covenant, had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Does God make a faulty covenant? That's not what he's referring to. He's not referring to the covenant itself. He's referring to the practitioners of that covenant. In verse 8, he says, Because finding fault with them, the practitioners, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now, when you are reading this in bold letters, in, in, in full caps, because it is a quotation from the Old Testament document. In verse 10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Obsolete. The word obsolete means it, it is finished. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. He's telling the Jewish Christians that covenant you people are trying to fulfill is obsolete. It's no longer existing. It's vanished. It's gone. So the new covenant was put in place to remove the old in its entirety. He did not come and say, okay, let's take some of the old here. Let's take some. And we're going to make some statements further. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we read this uh, earlier when we're talking of giving. V uh, chapter 8, verse 8, he said, this is Paul writing, he says, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. When he was taught, telling them to give, what was he saying there? He said, look, I am not, I don't, I'm not commanding you to do any giving. I want to test your love, your commitment to what you promised. So what am I saying here? Yes, the Old Testament has been removed, has been abrogated. There's a new covenant that does not put any burden on you to, to, or commandment on you to pay tithe or do anything of that sort. God now wants to test your love. The fact that they, you don't have to pay tithe, does it mean that you will not support the work of the gospel? Does it mean you will not give for the, to the needy? Does it mean that you will not give to the welfare and the upkeep of the ministers of the gospel? Even with the time that many people are pursuing and killing themselves on, how many of them are faithful? So God is saying, it is not commanded. You are not compelled to do it. If you choose to give 5% every month, 
diligently do it. I want to test your love. I want to test if indeed you honor me. If you choose to give 50%, then do it dutifully. Let it not fail. Because I, am, I, 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 I want meat to be in the house of God. I want the ministers to be, to, to be, to be taken care of. I don't want like what was happening in the old, in the old, under the old uh, covenant when the Levites were torn between maintaining the work of God and going to their farms. So the people who, for example, have been saying that if you are collecting tithe as a pastor, that you are a thief, they, they are ignorant and have made a very careless and reckless statement. Yes, pastors don't collect tithe, but you are supposed to be taken care of. If you say that you want to deal with the unnecessary, exuber uh, un unnecessary ostentation of uh, ministers of the gospel, I agree with that. But to now use one brush to, to rubbish the giving to the ministers is, is contrary to scripture in itself. We cannot do that. The Bible says, do not muzzle the ox while it treads the floor. The Bible makes it clear that God is not particular about ox alone. He's talking about human beings. Those who minister the gospel should be partakers of our material goods. We must take care of the ministers of the gospel. We must take care of the widows, of the, of the fatherless, of strangers, of those with needs in the church. Which was what happened in, in Acts chapter 4 that we read, which was our, 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 our main text. Secondly, the only outstanding, the, the, the only subsisting covenant today is the new covenant. No other covenant, only the new covenant subsists. Every other covenant has been wiped away. They don't exist anymore. I would advise you to read Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. Read those two, two, two chapters. Don't have time to go through that lengthy thing. The bottom line is that it's been taken away. Let me just read a few portions of chapter 9 and then you can read the rest. Uh, chapter 9, Hebrews 9 from verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service. Talking of the, the old covenant now. Divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared and the first, the, the first part and so on and so forth. It talks about all those things. And then he now comes and, and, and talks about what Christ did. That Let me read from verse 12. It says, Not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of Haifa sprinkling could solve, solve the problem, in verse 4 it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. We are coming to something here. The way they lived under the old covenant was law. The way we live under the new covenant is grace. And I know that many people have abused grace. But we are going to explain some things now that will let you see the folly of those people who are abusing grace. Bottom line, which is my third statement now, is that Christ is the end of everything. He is the one that came and put a stop to all the other things that people are doing. And by him now we live. In John chapter 1, 16 and 17. John chapter 1, 16 and 17. The Bible tells us, it says, And of his, that is of Christ's fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What is the Bible telling us here? Moses was a lawgiver. Christ, a life giver. Moses' people were ruled by law. The people under the covenant of Christ by life, the life of Christ. We are going, with, we are going to explain this as we go on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm reading verse uh, 45 or so. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So Christ came to give us life. Now, Romans chapter 8. 
verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life, the force of this life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law which is tied to sin and death. That law, that law of the new heaven, of, of the new of the old covenant, brought made me to become aware of sin, and that led me to death because I could not do anything better. But now there's a greater law in place, a greater force in place, and that force or that law is the law of of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So whilst people who lived by the law of Moses struggled with the law. Those who live under Christ don't struggle with the law. Why? Because they are living by, by Christ's law. They are living by, by the life of Christ. Which means that everything that we do is orchestrated by the Lord Jesus Christ in us if they are a Christian. Galatians chapter 2. Paul had a, 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 an issue with uh, Peter at one time because uh, Peter um, was, he, he was, he was eating with the, with the Gentiles when he came. And then when some brethren from Jerusalem came, he, he withdrew. And Paul was offended. At, uh, Paul was angry with him and said, what are you doing? You are, you, are, you, are, you are just being hypocritical. And so he now says from verse 15, we who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So the people who are telling us that if we don't pay tithe, God will shut the windows of heaven to, against us. They are trying to live by law. They are trying to live by the law. And Paul is saying, we who are Jews, by nature, we chose to believe in Christ because we know that we cannot be justified by the law. So Peter, why are you trying now to live by the law, having come to Christ? Because the law says that a Jew cannot be in fellowship with a Gentile. And so Peter was, was still under that law. And there are many of us like that. We are still living under the law. What is sad about our case is that we were born Gentiles. But suddenly we want to live under the law. And the Bible says, by the law, no man is justified. No man can come to, can get to eternity by the law. Let's continue to read. Uh, I, I'm skipping a lot of things. I'll read verse 19 and 20 because of time. For I, through the law, die to the law, that I might live to God. What did Paul say there? He said, I die to the law. That is, the law has no effect on me. The law of circumcision, no effect on me. The law of tithing, no effect on me. The law of um, marriage, all those laws, no effect on me. I died. All those laws no, no longer hold me bound. But does that mean that I'm going to act irresponsibly? No. I live. By faith in Christ Jesus. In verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Let me read this in the, let me read uh, this in the easy to read. Let me read from verse 19. It says, it was the law itself that caused me to end my life under the law. I died to the law so that I could live for God. In other words, if he didn't die to the Lord, he couldn't live for God. I have been nailed to the cross with Christ. So I am not the one living now. It is Christ living in me. I still live in my body. But I live by faith in the Son of God. He is the one who loved me and gave himself to save me. So I'm living by the life of God. As I am sitting down here, it is the life of God in me. That is a lie. The, li the, the life of, 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 of Christ, he will now direct me by his spirit on what to do and what not to do. And he says to me, you are no longer under law, but you are now under grace. Let's go to chapter 3 of Galatians and read from verse 10 to include what we read earlier about uh, Abraham, which was uh, uh, Galatians 3, I think from verse 12 or so to 15. 
But I'm reading it now in the easy to read from verse 10. But people who depend on following the law to make them right are under a curse. If you are following tithing because you think, oh, God will beat me, God will kill me. He says you are under a curse. As the scripture says, they must do everything that is written in the law. If they do not always obey, they are under a curse. So if you want to obey the law of tithing, then you must obey every single ordinance. And there are 613 of them. You are going to have a problem there. So he says you are going to be under a curse. Because you are not fulfilling the entire law. If you commit adultery and you pay tithe, you are a sinner under the law. If you, um, if, if, if you disobey authority or you disobey your husband, let's say, let's say you're a wife, and you think that by paying tithe, that is overlooked. No, you are still a sinner. You're under law. Let's read verse 11 now. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by the law. Nobody. The scriptures say, the one who is right with God by faith will live forever. Only those who are right with God, the just shall live by faith. That's what he's saying there. Verse 12, the law does not depend on faith. No, it says that the only way a person will find life by the law is to obey its commands. The law says we are under a curse for not always obeying it. But Christ took away that curse. So you see, when, the, when God was saying to, when Malachi was saying, through, uh, when God was saying through Malachi, that you, you, generation, you are cursed with a curse because you are not paying tithe. It's because tithe was a, a, a command under the law. You say you are cursed, even though you are doing everything, but because you are not tithing, you are cursed. But Christ took away that curse. He changed places with us and put himself under that curse. The scriptures say, anyone who is hung on a tree is under a curse. Because of what Jesus Christ did, the blessing God promised to Abraham was given to all people. Remember, I said that this issue was about Abraham and Christ and everybody else. He was not talking about tithe or, or some other thing that they are referring to there. Christ died so that by believing in him, we could have the spirit that God promised. Verse 15 now. Brothers and sisters, let me give you an example from everyday life. Think about an agreement that one person makes with another. After that agreement is made official, no one can stop it and add or add anything to it and no one can ignore it. God made promises to Abraham and his descendant. The scripture does not say unto your descendants. That would mean many people. But it says unto your descendant. That means only one. And that one is Christ. This is what I mean. The agreement that God made, gave to Abraham was made official long before the law came. The law came 430 years later. So the law could not take away the agreement and change God's promise. Now, you see what is, how it is explaining that now in the easy to read. Can following the law give us the blessing God promised? If we could receive it by following the law, then it would not be God's promise that brings it to us. But God freely gave his blessings to Abraham through the promise God made. So what was the law for? The law was given to show the wrong things people do. Paul said, I didn't know. That covetousness was wrong until I read, thou shalt not covet. I thought it was okay. Let's bring it to modern terms. You are driving on the highway at whatever speed you choose. Until you come to a place, you now see a pole that says you shouldn't go beyond 80 kilometers per hour. Law has started. So you now realize that all this driving I've been driving since, I've, 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 I've broken the law. So what, does, what did the law do? The law made you to break, to... To, to know that you're a sinner. But you couldn't help yourself. So what do I do when I broke the law since? And I'm now used to breaking the law. So even though I see 80 kilometers per hour, I'm not reducing my speed. I'm still going ahead. But when Christ came and lived in us, Christ is the one that says to you, put your foot on the accelerator. Let me help you to obey the law. Put your foot on the accelerator, uh, on the brakes rather, and reduce your speed. 
Because you are now obeying Christ, what is happening? You are obeying the law. That's all it says. So essentially what he's saying is that even if you didn't have a Bible, let's assume you didn't have a Bible, you didn't know that people tithe, you didn't know anything about the word of God, or anything about the law of God, but you have Christ. Following Christ alone will lead you to salvation, will lead you to eternity. Whereas the man who has the Bible, but is busy trying to fulfill the law under the old covenant, and forgetting that he's under a new covenant, will go to hell. So what, let, let's do 19 again. So what was the law for? The law was given to show the wrong things people do. The law would make continue until the special descendant of Abraham came. This is the descendant mentioned in the promise, which came directly from God. But the law was given through angels, and angels used Moses as a mediator to give the law to the people. But when God gave the promise, there was no mediator, because a mediator is not needed when there's only one side, and God is one. That day that God said to your seed, will I give this land? If there was nobody, it was only God. That's why the Bible says that because there was nobody, God swore by himself. So Abraham was not even a part of it. Abraham was just there and God was making a promise to him. Abraham did not need to make any promise. Abraham did not need to say, I will do this, I will do No, just like us. We too, we don't have to make a vow that we are going to do it. No, just live by Christ has come to live in us. And in living in us, he will make us to live as he wants us to live. Verse 21, does this mean that the law works against God's promises? Of course not. The law was never God's way of giving new life to people. If it were, then we could be, we could, uh, then we could be made right with God by following the law. So the law never made anything right. It was Christ that by his life that made things right for us. So like I said earlier, Moses was the lawgiver. Christ, the life giver. We live through Christ. We live by him. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse, um, let me read it from verse 4. John 15 from verse 4. Uh, okay, let me still leave it in easy to read. It says, stay joined to me and I will stay joined to you. No branch can produce fruit alone. I must stay connected. It must stay connected to the vine. It is the same with you. You cannot produce fruit alone. You must stay joined to me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you stay joined to me and I to you, you will produce plenty of fruit. But but, but separated from me, you won't be able to do anything. If you don't stay joined to me, you will be like a branch that has been thrown out and has dried up. All the dead branches like that are gathered up, thrown into the fire and burned. Stay joined together with me and follow my teachings. If you do this, you can ask for anything you want and it will be given to you. Show that you are my followers by producing much fruit. This will bring honor to my father. So what is, what, is, what is the Lord saying here? The Lord is telling us simply, stay joined to me. I am the one giving you life. Through my life, you will live. But if you are, if you are thinking that tithe is what will give you eternal life, you have missed it. If you think that tithe is what will bring you prosper true prosperity, you have missed it. You are, you are walking under the law, under a curse. Why should you, why do you want to continue with something that has been abrogated, something that has been removed? When Christ has given us new life, brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came, he ended the regime of the law which included time. There was that interregnum between the coming of Christ and the New Testament. So Christ, when he lived, lived what was, he, he used the Bible, the Old Testament Bible, the Old Testament scriptures. That's what he used. But he did not live by the ordinances of the Old Testament because he was, he was here to take it away. And so to show us that this is how to live. 
And so when the Pharisees kept arguing with him about the issue of the Sabbath, he said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I'm not bound by that commandment. You guys are missing the point. You fail to realize what the Lord was saying there. God is saying, you must rest one day in seven days. He did not pick a specific day. This is the problem with people who want to pick a doctrine and establish a whole church on it. That's the problem that I have with my, with my brothers in the Seventh-day Adventists. So they hold on to Saturday and say this is Sabbath. That is not the point. The point is your body must rest. And yet they spend the whole day on that Saturday in the church. Walking. When they're supposed to be reclining, resting. That's what the Sabbath is meant for. That's what it was supposed to be. But men turned it into something all because we want to work to benefit eternal life. But eternal life comes through Christ. That's what he said. I am eternal life. Not by following these precepts. Follow me. Let me lead you. Let me guide you. So I conclude, my brothers and my sisters, by telling you, allow Christ to lead you. Allow Christ to guide you. Don't let men mislead you. Don't let men take you away from the course. Follow Christ and he will speak to you. And you will know that indeed, when the old covenant was abrogated, everything pertaining to that covenant was removed. Everything was removed. The new came in. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, all things, uh, 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 sorry, all, all things have become new. All things have passed away. Behold, everything is new. When man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a completely new person. The old is completely taken away. The new has come. The new is the new covenant. The new is the way you are supposed to now live under Christ. No more bringing of the old. No, the old is gone. If there was a need for us to have any part of the old, <coughs> excuse me, in the new, we would have been told. Don't forget that the apostles themselves their scripture was the Old Testament scripture, which what we call Old Testament scripture. They read that same scripture and saw life in that same scripture. So even if we had nothing else, we can still see life in that Old Testament document. But thank God for the, the documentation of what they were teaching. Today we now have what is called the New Testament documents, which is from Matthew right to Revelation. And we now know what God meant under the old covenant and what it now means under the new covenant. That we are to live our lives through Christ by his spirit. Which is why you get born again. You get born again so that, the God, so that Christ can be put in us by his spirit. If you are not born again, the spirit of God cannot come in. And even if you are born again and you are disobedient continually, the spirit of God will soon leave. So we must live right. And God is putting things in place. You are not, don't put yourself under condemnation if you don't tithe. Many of you don't tithe anyway. But you bring yourself under condemnation when you don't act responsibly. When you have and you cannot take care of your neighbors. When you have and you are not meeting the needs of the ministers of the gospel, those who labor in the world. Then you bring yourself under condemnation. But to tithe or not to tithe, no, that's not the issue here. So please, the truth of the matter is that the tithe is an Old Testament creation. It doesn't exist. If you're a Christian, you are not supposed to, the issue of tithing doesn't work. But it doesn't mean that you don't make regular contributions to those who minister the word before. We've, we've discussed all of this in time past. And we are merely emphasizing it again here. Act responsibly. Become one who is committed to the local assembly where you are, to, to, to ministers of God, the ministers of the gospel, who are a blessing to you. If you, if you don't have the address, look for the address and send something to them. Lo locate them and send something to them. I'm not asking for myself. It's a standard thing. You should, you should, be, you should behave responsibly. By the grace of God, uh, next week we will discuss um, something else, I, I hope. And uh, we'll move away from this subject of um, the, the uh, what's it called now? The issue of meeting needs in the church. Uh, I'm hoping that the Lord will give us a new thing to discuss and then we'll move forward with that. So, uh, for now, just say, God bless you. Go home, 
read about these things. Pray about them. Ask God, Lord, this thing I've heard, what are you saying? Make it clear to me. Expound it, expose it to me. Let me know more and more of these things. And I'm trusting the Almighty God that He will speak to your heart and He will encourage you. Until next week, God bless you.